It is well known from the Bible that Noah built the ark that God instructed him according to the Bible with very specific details to follow in order to reach the correct dimensions to save life on earth in the form of an ark. We may not be able to agree on what the ark was exactly, but what we can agree on is the fact that other cultures around the world are telling the same exact story, exactly the same in as many details. In the Babylonian epic of the Great Flood, known as the Atrahasis, which means exceedingly wise, Atrahasis was the god-man and the god was Inki, who warned him of impending doom. Inki wanted Atrahasis to save himself, and so Inki told him how to construct an ark. He heeded the warning of the god, and so it is said that two of every animal was preserved. The Atrahasis and the story of Noah are eerily similar. Almost inconceivable, actually, that two separated civilizations with different logic would dramatically credit a doomsday scenario with striking accuracy in the same way. Almost like scenarios were being carried out all across the earth in front of different people all at the same time. Therefore, the warnings are global or civilization at that time was globally connected before the separation occurred. Inki is known as the bearer of culture, god of purification and cleansing, and commander of the waters. Inki governed sorcery and art, and he was the form-giving god. In Akkadian, he is known as Eh, lord of the earth, and he fixed national boundaries and assigned other gods their roles, and according to another Sumerian myth, Inki is the creator having devised men as slaves to the gods, and it's possibly because of this creation of man that he tried to save us before the gods left the earth under catastrophic conditions. It is because of Inki's actions that life and civilization was saved on the earth. He knew of the coming apocalypse, and just like we see in the story of Noah, Atrahasis constructed an ark, whatever that represents. It saved life as we know it. Wait till you hear this. According to the renowned researcher Stephanie M. Daly, who is a senior research fellow at Oxford University and has dedicated her life to translating Akkadian and ancient literature, make a note, Kronos, the astrohasis begins after the creation of the world, but before the appearance of human beings. And according to Stephanie Daly's translation, it reads as follows. When the gods instead of man did the work, bore the loads, the God's load was too great, the work too hard, the trouble too much. The great Anunnaki made the Igagai, the younger gods, carry the workload sevenfold. Anu, their father, was king. Anu went up to the sky, and Alil took the earth for his people. The bolt, which bars the sea, was assigned to far-sighted Inki. When Anu had gone up to the sky, and the gods of the Apsu had gone below. The Anunnaki of the sky made the younger gods bear the workload. The younger gods had to dig out canals, had to clear channels, the lifelines of the land. The gods dug out the Tigris River and then dug out the Euphrates. They were counting the years of loads. For 3,600 years, they bore the excesses, hard work, night and day. They groaned and blamed each other, grumbled over the masses of excavated soil. With no end in sight, the gods suggested that they comfort our chamberlain and get him to relieve us of our hard work. The elder gods made the younger gods do all the work on the earth, and after digging the beds for the Tigris and Euphrates River, the young gods finally rebelled. It was Inki, the god of wisdom, who suggests the immortals create something new, human beings who will do the work instead of the gods, so the idea for genetically modifying the first Adam is born. The goddess Ninhursag adds flesh, blood, and intelligence to clay and creates seven males and seven female human beings. This is the creation according to the Atrahasis. At first, the gods enjoy the leisure the human workers afford them, but in time, the people become too loud and disturb the gods' rest. Enlil, the king of the gods, is especially annoyed by the constant disturbance from below and so decides to lessen the population by sending first a drought 
then pestilence, and then famine down upon the earth. After each of these plagues, the humans appeal to the God who first conceived of them, Inky, and he tells them what to do to end their suffering and return the earth to a natural productive state. Enlil, however, finally can stand no more and persuades the other gods to join him in sending a devastating flood to earth, which will completely wipe out the human beings. Inki takes pity on his servant, the kind and wise Atrahasis, and warns him of the coming flood, telling him to build an ark and to seal two of every kind of animal within. Atrahasis does as he is commanded, and the deluge begins as follows again, according to Oxford scholar Stephanie Daly, who translates the tablet three as follows. The flood came out. No one could see anyone else. They could not be recognized in the catastrophe. The flood roared like a bull, like a wild donkey screaming. The winds howled. The darkness was total. There was no sun. The mother goddess Ninhursak weeps for the destruction of her children. She was sated with grief. She longed for beer in vain. And the other gods weep with her in grief. After the waters subside, Enlil and the other gods realize their mistake and regret what they have done. Yet feel there was no way they could undo the destruction unleashed. At this point, Atrahasis comes out of his ark and makes a sacrifice to the gods. Enlil, though only just before wishing he had not destroyed humanity, is now furious at Inki for allowing anyone to escape alive. Inki explains himself to the assembly. The gods descend to eat of Atrahasis' sacrifice. And Inki then proposes a new solution to the problem of human overpopulation. Create new creatures who will not be as fertile or live as long as the last. From now on, it is declared that demons who will snatch infants away and women will be consecrated to the gods who will have to remain virgins until marriage. Atrahasis himself is carried away to paradise to live apart from these new human beings whom Ninhursak then creates. The best known tale of the Great Flood, of course, is from the biblical book of Genesis, in which God becomes incensed with the wickedness of humanity and destroys them with a flood, except for the righteous Noah and his family. The biblical work draws on the earlier, much older oral version of the Mesopotamian flood story, which is echoed here in this video and which may also have influenced an Egyptian text known as the Book of the Heavenly Cow. The Book of the Heavenly Cow tells how, after the sun god Ra had created humans, they rebelled against him and he decided to destroy them. He sent the goddess Hathor as an extension of himself, known as the Eye of Ra, to slaughter humanity, but after she had killed many, he repented of the decision. He then had massive quantities of beer dyed red to look like blood and ordered it planted in Hathor's path. She drank the beer fell asleep and later woke up as the loving goddess and friend to humanity that she is usually depicted as. Almost every culture has some form of great flood story, and this is often cited as proof that there must have been some cataclysmic deluge at some point. However, as it is just as possible that a popular flood story repeated down through the ages inspired storytellers in different regions, Stephanie Daly states that all these flood stories may be explained as deriving from the one Mesopotamian original used in traveler's tales for over 2000 years along the great caravan routes of Western Asia. Translated, embroidered and adapted according to local taste to give a myriad of divergent versions, a few of which have come down to us. The Atrahasis, like the story of Noah's Ark, is of course a tale of hope and faith in a deeper meaning to the tragedies of the human experience. Tragedies that we are picking through in modern times, recollecting the thoughts of the past written down for all time and sieving through the ages to try to explain in any given moment who we are. What is our purpose floating about on a planet in space with no apparent neighbors? And maybe the answers to our past and in fact our creation are found in the most ancient texts that we know of and the critical thinkers like the scholar Stephanie Daly are dedicating their lives to translating these answers into a language 
that we can all make sense of, but what do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below, and as always, thank you for watching.